Welcome to Rogue Trader. Please read the disclaimer and remember that prices can go down as well as up. Hello and welcome to another Rogue Trader video. And today I'm looking at Rio Tinto. Rio Tinto are the world's third largest mining company. As you can see, 76% of their EBITDA comes from iron ore, with 9% from aluminium, 9% from copper and diamonds and 6% from energy and minerals. This means in fact that they're rather a one trick pony with much of their success down to what's going on with the iron ore market. We can see here that over time, they've got rid of their coal and uranium assets. And this has led to iron ore, which already dominated, now accounting for the lion's share of all their EBITDA. So that's a bit unfortunate really, that they are a one trick pony. And much of their success then is related to the price of iron ore you can see how their share price has crashed in the later part of this year that definitely correlates with the price of iron ore despite this they have a 9.4 billion free cash flow and 9.8 billion of net income and are paying a nine percent dividend while still being able to spend 0.6 billion a year on exploration so this does make them a very attractive company in terms of their raw numbers here on looking at their longer term share price, it's quite noticeable that there's a linear trend here and they do look quite a good prospect in the future if we believe in a inflationary future. In 2018, they announced a big portfolio reshaping to the account of 12 billion and they announced that they were selling their entire coal business. They also sold some uh, copper resources and a aluminium smelter in Dunkirk. That was so that they could then focus all their aluminium smelting to be environmentally friendly only stuff. In 2019, they sold off their uranium assets as well as their Hell Creek coal mine for 1.5 billion to Glencore and their Kestrel coal mine for 2.3 billion. They also sold off a copper mine. But looking at the price of coal since then, it, looked like, it looks like it was a bad move selling their coal assets. And also uranium has been hitting the roof lately, so that was a bad move as well. In 2020, we then had the corona crash, but they were still raking in loads of money. And in fact, their sales weren't really affected by the corona crisis at all. So things looked like they were going swimmingly until they had the Juck and Gorge scandal, which led to them having to sack their CEO plus two of their top execs. So the Juck and Gorge is a mining area they have, which has a cave in it which has evidence of human occupation for over 46,000 years. It seems that it wasn't actually even known about until 2009, and Rio Tinto already had the mining rights there, and they, but they still got a grant from the government to exploit the area, and they essentially blew up the cave in 2020. But only after they did that was there the massive uproar. There's obviously loads of protests and loads of bad optics for them, and... You can see here a picture of the actual cave that uh, was the source of all that trouble. But nevertheless, they got in a new CEO and uh, things were going really good as we went into 2021. One very unfortunate incident of note was their general manager at their South African titanium mine was shot on the way to work, which gives us a bit of complexion, very risky areas that uh, these commodity companies have to work in for, in order to exploit some of these resources. But then when their interim results came out in July of 2021, but when their interim results came out in July of 2021, it was absolutely outstanding numbers. In their interims for 2021, their operating profit was even better than the whole of the year 2020. So they really did produce an excellent set of results. They also received the green light for a 2.6 billion Jadar lithium project in Serbia, where they want to move into lithium because obviously that's all the rage now because of electronic vehicles. So I actually bought Rio Tinto here and then the share price subsequently plummeted. You can see here where I purchased them and then where I sold them. This just goes to show why I need to do the work before I make my investments. This is only the second time I've made an investment without doing all the work first and putting a video in. And sure enough, this is the second time it's been a real bad move. I think it's fair to attribute the drop in share price to what's been going on with the iron ore price. But if I told you that this here was the point where I made that purchase, 
maybe if I'd done my homework, I would have had a bit of a more careful look at the iron ore price before making that move. The price has gone up a bit since I prepared this slide, but they're currently paying about a 9% dividend at these lower prices. And so obviously the dividend, the dividend situation is very attractive for this stock. I looked into iron ore shipments a bit and we see that actually Rio's revenues are mostly to China. And you can see how in recent years, the amount of iron ore being shipped to China has increased from Rio Tinto at the expense of Europe and North America and the rest of the world. And we can see that within China, 56% of this uh, of this iron ore is used for construction. And it's quite interesting that this drop in the iron ore price does seem rather coincidentally to match the when all the bad news started coming out about the Evergrande price crisis. Of course, the Evergrande crisis has been in the news a lot, and actually the news flow, the news story is developing. You've, you've not heard people shouting and screaming about it generally, but when you look, there are news stories coming out um, under the surface um, that this problem might not be over yet. The Evergrande crisis revolves around this company, which is one of the China's largest real estate builders who've been building these massive ghost cities all around China. I recommend the ADV China YouTube group for some on the ground information on this. These guys were driving around on their motorbikes. I really like these guys YouTube channel and in it they went riding around China in their motorbikes and you can see them exploring these ghost cities. So what happened is over the last 10 years there's been a massive real estate and property bubble in China. And I do believe that a lot of this iron ore going into China has been to help fuel that. So essentially, because it's a communist country, it's quite difficult for people to invest over there. So one of the few things that people could invest in is real estate. And what happened is, over time, the price of houses just got out of hand where the tiniest flat in the most undesirable of areas would fetch a price equivalent to that in a large city in the UK or something. And it got to a point where these real estate companies were just building cities in the middle of nowhere, as you can see in this video. And essentially, these were people in cities, other parts of the country, buying little flats in these ghost cities that they were never even going to go and visit on the back of this massive real estate bubble, probably the biggest ever in history. Well, finally, this bubble burst and the, all, these, all these companies are now going bankrupt. And I do find it very interesting that all those happenings seem to correlate with the drop in the iron ore price. And although you don't hear it on the news every day like it was when it first broke out, there are more and more companies going bankrupt, it seems, and getting downgrades. So, it's not really clear to me that this disaster is over or not. I think that the, there is some people saying that China's, China is like the, the mother of MMT. And just like Western governments have been bailing people out with some kind of limited form of MMT, China's, the Chinese government can go full MMT on this by using debt the same way that the Western governments have back in uh, 2008. But if we look at iron ore prices, they are going up again now in line with the Rio Tinto share price. I'd certainly want to wait a, wait a while to see this trend confirmed because it's I, I feel a little bit uneasy about that at the moment. Because I feel a little bit uneasy about assuming it's all OK at the moment when you consider the sheer scale of what's going on there. So looking into the different areas of this business and starting with iron ore, most of Rio Tinto's iron ore is from over in the Australia Pilbara region. And in fact, these, uh, good eye, uh, these good eye projects are also in the Pilbara region. And as you can see, they do have these uh, projects downstream uh, in good eye area. But um, it looks like they're just simply maintaining the same high levels of iron ore production in the Pilbara region. They're not particularly expanding or it's not like going down as an overall proportion. 
It's noteworthy that the Pilbara blend is apparently the world's the most recognised brand of iron ore. They also actually have a salt operation in Australia, which is the world's largest export of seaborne salt. And that's thrown in with their iron ore segment. Aluminium is 9% and most of this is also in Australia. They don't seem to be expanding their aluminium portfolio. Now copper, copper is 9% of their EBITDA. And obviously copper is all the rage at the moment because of the electric cars and the electrification of the world's electricity network. And as you can see, most of their copper currently comes from Chile. And actually, by the way, there's only recently been some bad news stories coming from Chile because they've got this left wing government come in. And there's some speculation that they might start attacking the, the, the mining industry. But um, they also have uh, some resources in the US. The Kennecott's resources are going to run out by 2026. But they still seem to have the Chile resources here. And then coming online properly around 2030 will be their Mongolian operations. Now they're... Their Mongolia Oyu Tolgai mining operations are going to be one of the largest copper mines in the world. It will represent Mongo it will actually represent thirty percent of Mongolian GDP when in full de development. And the Mongolian government are thirty four percent shareholders in the project. So it's good to see that they'll be doubling up their copper production from twenty thirty onwards. But unfortunately it, you know that's still quite but unfortunately that's still quite a long time before you see that kicking in so it doesn't really save you from having to accept that it's all iron ore at the moment really when you consider rio tinto as an investment energy and minerals represent six percent of their total EBITDA, and this is mainly their us borate which actually is 30 percent of the world supply of borates they really want to get into the lithium game because obviously everyone's really hot on lithium at the moment because of the EV vehicles thing. They're extracting lithium from their from the waste rocks at their current US site, but that's only a pathetic 10 tonnes a year. So really we need to wait till 2030 when we'll have this uh, Serbian Jadar development fully online. But only in, feet, but only in recent weeks they've suddenly d halted all work there because there are massive demonstrations in Serbia about these mines. It really is unbelievable. Um, there's all these people, um, there's all these people protesting against these mines because they're considered environmentally unfriendly. But the whole reason they're being developed is to enable the production of electric vehicles to help the environment. But it does also highlight how with these commodity company, commodity companies, even if it's in the West or the East, it's difficult for them to develop new projects because there's massive environmental protests about it, as well as money grabs from left-wing governments in other cases. Stating that only in the last few days they did announce there a 0.8 billion investment in this Argentinian recon lithium development, but I haven't got much information on that. But there is, uh, they are, they, they have got the ability of just to buy out already existing operations as well, and I wonder if that's what we'll see a bit more of. Their diamonds is now obliterated to nearly nothing. Um, they have some iron, high-grade iron ore assets, but it's not really anything significant. They have, of course, their titanium in South Africa. Their uranium now, they've got. I, I think their uranium now is fully sold off or in the final run out. When I look at their profit and loss, they've got excellent numbers. The income is maintained at a high level, the expenditure is stable, and their operating profit has continued to increase, plus their net income too. A really lovely set of numbers. And of course, like I said, their half year 2021 numbers were even better than the whole of the previous year in terms of operating profit and net income. It was a 60% improvement on the previous half. You can see that reflected here in their net income in, in their net income history. This bumpiness here is caused by them sell, selling their coal assets 
in 2018 which you can see here as their net gains on disposals a really good picture in terms of their basic numbers here i thought as it was so cut and dry i would spend a little bit of time on this uh, little outlier here the impairment charges in 2019 are 3.5 billion i thought why not spend a bit of time on that to help me understand what it actually means so i found this in the notes of their annual reports and you can see the impairment charge here is 3.5 billion matching the number here and this related to their oyu tolgoi project for copper and the their aluminium refine and their alumina refinery in yarwun so what was so what are impairment charges well it turns out they're, they're a reduction in the recoverable value of a fixed asset and in the case of this uh, Mongolian copper mine, the, the mine was delayed by 30 months and they had to spend more money on capex. So the increased capex spend plus the deferred tax losses that can't be cashed in because the mine was delayed, that then is represented as a 2.2 billion impairment charge. And the aluminium smelter was that was down to a change in their accounting, whereas before the alumina refinery was considered as part of their mining operations and they've moved it to a separate cash generating unit. And then that that bit of uh, that little bit of jockeying with the books has led to a impairment charge of one point one billion. So I thought, why not take the opportunity to uh, take a look at that and understand what impairment charges are. Their assets are completely dominated by the property plant and equipment. And when I break that down, I was actually expecting most of their assets to be the actual mining areas with, you know, with the copper and stuff in the ground. Actually, the mining properties is only 11 billion of their total assets. And interestingly, the actual equipment on that land is worth three times more, 32.8 billion. So I think when they work out the value of their exploration, I think when they work out the value of the exploration rights and their mining properties, they, they work out longer term cash flow and work out how much it's going to cost as well to extract the resources. And so that's why, surprisingly, the actual mining land they own is only a relatively small consideration of their overall assets. In their debt, really, the only thing noteworthy was that they have about 15 billion of pension liabilities. But the debt doesn't seem that bad overall, or their liabilities don't seem that bad overall. And the 13 billion of debt seems fairly reasonable when you consider they could pay most of it off with the cash they have about of about 10 billion. The price to book value of Rio Tinto is 1.4, according to me, and 2.1, according to Reuters calculations. And you see that reflected there where I've got the total market cap alongside the total assets when you take away the liabilities. A cheap valuation when you compare it with non-commodity stocks. Obviously, I only had the data for this stuff up to 2020, uh, but then I update it to the latest share price. And you can see that with the latest drop in share price, the overall market cap is now getting close to touching the net assets again. They have impressive revenues when stacked up against the market cap with a price to sales of 1.6. And the debt there looks um, reasonable when matched against the cash and it's quite impressive the proportion of their net assets which are cash so from this representation they do look like a buy in the near future this is the statement of cash flows for 2020 full year and 22 billion of their cash flow coming came in from operating activities and of that 10 billion was just pure profit from selling metal and that is very impressive to me because often a lot of the stocks I look at, much of the positive cash flows, things I don't really understand very well, like amortization and depreciation and stuff, which I have a real hard, hard time getting my head around. 
Well, in this case, you know, 10 billion is just pure profit going into operating activities. So it's very clearly a healthy gush of cash coming into this company just from selling their products. They spent 7 billion on CapEx and 5.3 billion on tax with 1 billion on MISC. 0.6 billion, it was 600 million they had to spend on interest on their debt and they paid out 6.1 billion in dividends. So this left them with 2.4 billion of net cash gain and they now have 10.4 billion cash in the bank at the end of 2020. So if the statement of cash flows represents the heartbeat and circulatory system of a company, Rio Tinto is certainly in rude health. It's, this is very, very impressive. And when we look at the half year 2021, it's the same pattern, absolutely incredible positive cash flow. The numbers, their operating activities, they've got the same money coming in from operating activities in half one as they had the whole of the previous year. This looks really, really good. And they had a 3.6 billion cash gain in the first half. So I looked at their shareholders as of 5th of February 2021. Some of the major shareholders had been selling off JP Morgan, Citicorp, but HSBC Bank had been buying up. However, since between February and now, I couldn't see any detectable changes. So it seems like that's settled down now. I can't see anything bad in terms of my shareholder vigilance. It's notable again how retail investors are such a small part of the pie. And it was interesting to note that in their director shareholdings, John Sebastian here, he was the CEO, CEO who was sacked. He actually had a tremendously large number of shares. And it was interesting to see that he was able to offload them as part of him getting sacked. So presumably after blowing up those mines, he's enjoying life somewhere, retiring on a beach as a billionaire. So many months ago, I prepared this commodity stock graphic where you see dividend yields against the price to book. And Rio Tinto were up here. And uh, with their drop in share price, they're now somewhere down here. So they're looking even better value than they did then. But I'm very interested to take a look at Central Asia metals. In fact, I don't know why I didn't do them first. So in summary, the raw numbers of Rio Tinto are amazing. And, th and this is backed up by the statement of cash flow. I mean, absolute, amazing, stunning performance financially. The real problem I have with them is their dependency on the iron ore price, though. And I am kind of a bit once bitten, twice smitten, obviously, which is probably maybe clouding my judgment a little bit. But all the same, all the focus for them whether you go in or not has to be on the iron ore price and it's been trending up just the last month i had looked into getting some information on the um, iron ore imports into china according to the smm website imports have actually increased in november and then interestingly looking at the trading economics website which uses the chinese communist data that says that they're actually going down However, it would kind of make sense for the Chinese government to be underplaying their imports because they want the price to stay down so they get the iron ore cheaper, whilst these relatively independent experts suggest otherwise. This SMM website, the, the links I've got here, um, it's from the news.metal.com website. The... the it's a very useful resource and I found that they actually also give you inventory. According to the SMM website, the inventory actually increased a bit in the last week and they actually have a page where you see a report on the inventory levels for all the different resources for copper, aluminium, zinc, lead as well, lead ingots. So, and of course iron ore. And you can see here that iron ore stocks are actually higher than they were in previous years at this time of year. So one good output of this, one good output of doing the work on this video is this very useful website. 
which I'll be able to use when looking at other metals, when looking at other commodity stocks. But the non-Chinese government experts seem to think there is more there is more iron ore being exported to China and that's why the price is going up. So excellent numbers, excellent cash flow. For me, my only hesitation is on the iron ore price. And I feel like I'd like to add them to my watch list and just see what happens in the next few months. Um, particularly, is this, does this, has this Evergrande crisis been healed by some MMT from the Chinese government? Is the, you know, is the world economy going to be booming next year now that we're out of the corona crisis seemingly or is there perhaps something else going to happen like you know perhaps massive increases in interest rates leading to some general um, equity meltdown or something i think there's too much kind of risks macro and with the evergrande crisis still for me to dive in i probably am once bitten twice smitten a bit because of obviously my full hardy rush in to invest before and then now perhaps i'm being uh too careful now to overcompensate but i'm happy to uh sit out sit it out for a bit if i see things generally sh shaping up better in terms of the evergrown crisis and with the the u.s economy in particular then they would definitely be a good buy next year just a shame that they're a one-trick pony so that's my update of my, my verdict. Um, I'm going to wait out confirmation of the iron ore price trend, Evergrande and general equity macro factors before investing next year. And uh, yeah, the risk, there's because they're a one trick pony, the big risks for this is the iron ore prices. Could there be interest rate rises leading to a global slowdown? Could the Evergrande crisis that everyone's forgotten about already actually seriously affect iron ore imports into china next year so i hope you find this video useful please remember i'm doing this just for fun vlogging my own investment journey i'm in no no means any kind of expert but whatever you do do your homework and have fun